I'm Scott Al Miller. It's the 12th of March, 2023, and this is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today, we're going to be talking about what is the best city to come stay in and visit for a first time traveler who is coming to Nicaragua to investigate if they're looking to potentially relocate here. We'll be back after the bump. All right, so this is a very specific question that is not going to apply to a lot of people, but it's a pretty good one, and I think that the information is good for a lot of people coming to Nicaragua. Uh, the question is specifically, if you've never traveled before, or basically never traveled before, this would apply if you've traveled very, very lightly, is if you're coming to Nicaragua, because Nicaragua is not like going to Canada, it's not like going to England, there is quite a bit of cultural learning curve and language learning curve, uh, and so if you don't have travel experience under your belt, you're probably going to be looking for a little bit of comfort, a little bit of hand holding to help you through some of that process. So it's a it's a pretty important question because there are a fair number of people, especially those coming from the United States, who may have a pretty light history of travel and may find going to another uh, country and another culture a little bit intimidating. I totally understand it. The first time that I went to uh, continental Europe, which was the first time I really traveled to a non-English speaking country, um, it was it was certainly a bit of a shock and I really enjoyed it and I, I loved my time and I did it alone with no preparation um, but I totally understand what it's like hitting the ground and being like I do not know how things work right so coming to Nicaragua, Nicaragua is kind of a middle ground as far as cultural shock. It is clearly far more like American or British or Canadian or Australian or New Zealand culture than say basically any location in Asia or Africa or even potentially some far eastern parts of Europe. Like it's not the most foreign thing you can think of uh, as far as language or even food and culture. Most things are different but not that much different. However, Nicaragua is culturally quite far from the more um, American or North American leaning Latin American countries. You will find places like Mexico or Argentina to be less of a culture shock than Nicaragua, both from a cultural perspective from an income disparity perspective. So Nicaragua does present some challenges that some other Latin countries do not, but none of it's dramatic. You would certainly find Costa Rica to be way softer of an introduction. And if you're coming to Nicaragua by way of Costa Rica, sometimes that's a nice way to go because it gives you a step that really is kind of, and, and this is not meant to sound bad to Costa Ricans, but it's very much in the middle uh, between the United States and Nicaragua as far as culture. There's a much larger acceptance of US, U.S. currency, you have a higher rate of English speakers, you have many more American, actual American restaurants and, and businesses there, you have many more Americans there uh, by a dramatic degree, um, and you have many more services aimed at them and English speakers within the country. And, and a, generally, a general acceptance that there are going to be a lot of Americans, Canadians, and so forth. And so a lot of things are focused around that because it is a travel heavy country. Nicaragua lacks many of those things. So simply by coming here, you're going to have a bit more of a shock. That does not mean to make it sound scary. It is incredibly safe and friendly and welcoming, but you may very rapidly see a lot of things that are very different and anything you can do to soften that blow may make sense. All that said, there's a couple really obvious places. If you're just visiting and you're not really looking to investigate Nicaragua heavily, you may want to go to San Juan del Sur. I have to preface, San Juan del Sur is not super close to any airport, so one of the challenges of using it as a place to test the waters in the country is that you have to get to it one way or another, whether you're coming in through Costa Rica or coming in through Managua, and, and that presents a little bit of a challenge because it's not a large city and it is quite a distance from most anything, and that can be a little bit of a, whoa, those are things I don't want to deal with, and my dog just fell and killed that plant. Because one way or another, my dogs will never let these plants survive, no matter what we do. That was a crunching sound of her completely crunching the pot that it was in. I'm going to try to fix this. We'll be right back. All right, Operation Plant Rescue went satisfactorily. So San Juan del Sur, while it has the highest rate of English speakers, it has the most uh, vacationer and tourist infrastructure, has the easiest time for a foreigner to uh, spend time and feel like they're not in too exotic of a location, 
getting to and from it is not ideal. And because it is essentially an enclave or a semi enclave, um, you may find that your time there is not exactly, but kind of wasted if your goal is to investigate Nicaragua and really have a feel for what the country is like. If your interest is living in an enclave, then San Juan del Sur is where you need to go because it is the primary enclave and it is where you're going to have the best survey of what enclave life could be like living in Nicaragua, but in an enclave. But if it's Nicaragua that you're interested in, if you're interested in most of the things that I show on this channel, um, then you're going to want to avoid San Juan del Sur because it's not going to give you the introduction that you're hoping for. You may find it somewhat misleading. It's fine to go see it later when you already have the context and can tell which parts of it are catering to tourists and which parts are Nicaraguan, but going there first may not be ideal. So where should you go? The answer I think most people would agree on is Granada. I can rule out a few of the other cities right away. First of all, all the highland cities. They're simply too far away and have no tourist infrastructure whatsoever. Wonderful cities that I recommend highly for a lot of reasons, but not for first time travelers. There's the same problems as San Juan del Sur, that they're far away and you have to manage a lot of transportation as soon as you hit the ground, but also they have no tourist infrastructure. And so simple things like finding hotels or English speakers is unnecessarily challenging. Leon is a decent choice, and if you decided to do Leon instead of Granada, you would not be disappointed, but you may find it slightly harder to deal with things than Granada. We're a city of about twice the size. We have fewer English speakers. We have a smaller tourism infrastructure. We have those things. We're a viable option. We're probably the second best option in the country, but it's pretty clear, I think, to me, having lived in both places, that getting a soft introduction to the country, Granada wins out. It's really close to the airport. Leon is nearly two hours away. It is part of the capital urbanization, whereas Leon is rather far flung. Still only a few hours, not out of consideration, but it's pretty far away. Uh, traveling to other locations from Leon, it's a bit of a bit of a challenge. If you want to see, yes, Chinandega, you can take the bus, not a big deal. But from Granada, you can see places like Masaya or San Juan del Sur or Rivas or the capital, Managua, uh, very easily in, in a much shorter period of time. And you have more places to see. Uh, Granada has um, the lake and it has volcanoes and it has um, a big uh, tourist in industry of its own. Um, and so you have a lot of architecture to see, a lot of museums and uh, artwork and a broader range of restaurants, but your prices are going to be higher. But remember, this is your survey. This is your starter city, so that's okay. Spending a little bit of extra money day to day, it's easy to understand what cheaper is like. Right, it's, it's okay, so you spend some time in Granada and you say, okay, now if you went to Leon, everything would be just 90%, maybe 92% of the cost. Just imagine taking eight to 10% off of everything. Done, there's no, there's no like difficult explanation there. But if you're saying, okay, so the culture's a little bit different, people go out more at night, and so, so what exactly does that mean? How many more people, how lively? Is it safer or more dangerous? At what time of night? How do I do that? Do I take taxis, right? There's like a big complicated discussion around other aspects of culture. And some things like what kind of cheese do they have with breakfast? Yes, that varies by city and sometimes by town and obviously by restaurant, but sorry for the little, there was an, an ant crawling across the, the lens. Um, Right? How do you explain the differences in cheese between Granada and Leon? You have to taste it. You have to be there and experience it yourself. So those types of things are difficult, but the price difference is pretty straightforward. So if you're in Granada, yes, you're going to spend a little bit of extra money than other places, but it's still real Nicaraguan prices. It's not like San Juan del Sur where things are dramatically higher. And yes, there is the main uh, pedestrian way in Granada, and that is going to cost uh, quite a bit more. Those are very much tourist prices, but they also give you a tourist selection of restaurants, which trust me, when you first get here, you're going to appreciate. Over time, you'll start being most likely uh, able to adapt and say, you know what, I don't actually want to go to those places that often. I like having them accessible, but you know what, I can get to them by bus. I can go to Granada and check them out. I don't need to live there uh, for the frequency by which I will go to them. Sure, I wish we had a bigger restaurant selection here in Leon, but I also wish when I lived in Granada that everything was cheaper like here in Leon. So it's a trade-off and that will always be the case. Uh, but the biggest thing is in Granada, you have a lot of 
public transportation and tourism transportation, easy access to and from the main airport, easy access to and from the capital should you need to do anything such as extending a visa. Um, and you have a lot of English speakers who are in the same boat as you. They're testing the waters or maybe they've fallen in love with Granada and decided to move there. Uh, and so you have resources both of other expats that you can connect with, which may be important if you are uh, testing the waters or uh, with uh, businesses or services that are looking to assist expats. Whereas here in Leon, you have essentially none of that, not entirely none, but very low. And somewhere like Matagalpa will have none. Uh, and so the expectation that you're going to be a tourist makes Granada a little bit easier for you. And it's worth noting, Granada is where we started our Nicaragua adventure eight years ago in 2015. We lived on the northwest-ish side of El Centro within the, we were at the very last block of the tourist zone, which did put us in a high priced area, but it did mean we could walk to everything that people talk about in Granada very easily. And uh, it was a great adventure and I do appreciate the time that we had there. And part of our learning was that Nicaragua had a lot to offer us and that Granada was not the right combination of factors for us. It didn't have enough breeze, it had too many tourists, it was a little bit too expensive, it was too close to the capital, which we weren't really interested in. Actually, now I think we would readjust that, uh, but it didn't have the ocean, which is a big deal, and Leon does. So overall, uh, we love where we are. Um, and, and we got here by going to Granada first. Um, so I think very, very clearly, Granada is my recommendation. If you're going to go to one city, spend a few weeks, a few months testing the waters as a first time traveler, go there. It'll be the easiest for you to relax and be able to not feel an overwhelming amount of culture shock while still getting the experiences necessary to evaluate Nicaragua for you. Uh, one of the reasons that we don't say Managua, because obviously Managua is even closer to the airport and has even more resources. Managua is a pretty nice city and I like it a lot more than most people and it would not be an outrageous choice. However, it is uh, quite a bit more dangerous than the other cities. It is a big capital city. It is not like Granada and Leon and Masaya, which are mid-sized cities um, and, and much more far flung. They have extremely low criminal elements. Managua is a major city. It has a normal criminal element, which is not terrible. In no way should you avoid Managua, which is how it was presented to us when we first got here uh, eight years ago when we lived in Granada. People would be like, I was so terrified going to Managua. People would just rob you anywhere. No, we go to Managua all the time now. It's a perfectly safe city. It's normal, like anywhere else. But it's it's got the trash. It has uh, bad neighborhoods. It has a lot of traffic. It has just a lot of things that as a first time traveler to any other country, those things are nerve wracking. Those things are stressful. Those things worry you. And once you adapt and stuff, then it's like, whatever, I don't care. Those things are easy. It's just a normal city. It looks different. I, now I know my way around. The other cities are best. So if you're looking for a list, I would say Granada is number one. Maybe tied at number two is Leon and Masaya. Masaya being the mid-sized city laying directly between Granada and Managua. It gives you a bit of a different feel. Uh, you'll get much farther away from the expats. Uh, Granada having a lot of expats, Masaya having enough that you can find them, but probably similar to Leon. It is much more of a city for Nicaraguans, um, but a very different flavor than, than, Nicarag than Granada. Granada is a tourism-based city. It is the tourism-based city in Nicaragua. Masaya is not. It does have tourism stuff. It has like the famous market, has some really cool cultural stuff, and it's in a great location to be close to the airport, close to the capital, easy to get to Managua, like super easy to get to Managua. So Masaya is a great choice um, for this. So I would actually put it on par with Leon. If you're looking for an experience closer to the capital and more around expats, Messiah may be uh, the better option. And if you're looking for a little bit deeper of a Nicaraguan uh, escapism then, or the ocean, then Leon would be the better choice. But Granada is definitely number one. I would put Managua at number four. It has so many resources. The airport is right there. You don't need to deal with travel to anywhere. It has so many housing options, restaurant options, nighttime entertainment options that Yes, being in it is a pretty viable thing to do. So that would be number four. 
those are the only four I would recommend, um, and, and you heard my factors why. The Highlands are beautiful and wonderful, but as a first time traveler, I wouldn't put the travel there. Rivas, decent option, but it's a little bit far flung, and until you're really comfortable getting around and moving around the country um, and, and really have a grasp of it, you may find that it's a little bit difficult just to get the exposure that you're looking for. San Juan del Sur, again, an enclave. Uh, some cities like Boaco or Huigalpa are so far afield, and so out side of the expat knowledge base that you, you may feel that you've been left without resources, that you're very isolated. You really don't want to do that. Uh, if you're in Bidiambra or uh, Hinotepe, you um, are, are not in the worst of shape, but you're not in a real city, and that may leave you without a real city experience, which is mostly what expats are looking for. If you're not looking for a city experience, you're looking for more like a giant village or tiny city experience, uh, those are decent options, along with La Paz Centro or uh, Nagarote up here in Leon. However, you start getting into those size cities, or El Viejo in Chinandega, uh, you start running into the problem that they may not even have hotels. Like for real, some of those don't have hotels. La Paz Centro, not a single one. We've researched, we've talked to people, to locals, they're like, there isn't one, not a thing. Um, no Airbnb, nothing. Um, El Viejo, one hotel. It's quite nice, but only one. If it's full, you're out of luck. If it's expensive, you're out of luck. Uh, so you gotta balance those things. Sometimes you wanna be in a position where you can buy or at least rent an entire home uh, for a long term to check out those other places. Um, I did not mention Chinandega in that list. Chinandega is so outside of anyone's consideration because it is so hot and has so few expats. You get the problem of the uh, Huigalpa and Boaco style where it's so far out there, you may have that thought that you've fallen off the edge of the map um, along with a weather situation that is ridiculous. It is so hot. Unless Unless you're just researching ways you can punish yourself with heat, you don't want to be in Chinandega unless something else. It's a nice city. I like it. But the heat is unbearable, even as a Leonese. We're the second hottest city, right? All right. That's my recommendation. That's my list. I want to know what you guys think. Those of you who've been to Nicaragua, especially those who've gone through the cycle of, of testing the waters, learning, anyone who's been a first-time traveler, do you agree? Is Granada the place to be? I know Messiah is a great choice. How would you rank Messiah and Leon? Um, do you agree that Managua should be after them? Clearly, Managua requires you to be a lot more cautious. You can be pretty stupid as a traveler in the other three cities and nothing bad's gonna happen to you. If you get really dumb in Managua, bad things can happen, right? I mean, that's it's not the south side of Chicago. It's not Brooklyn at night. Like those places are much scarier. I'm just saying you need to be a bit more aware of your environment. In Leon, honestly, 3 a.m., I can get drunk and walk all the way through town with money in my pockets and nothing's going to happen to me. Don't do that. But if I did, I would be safe. All right, so that's my recommendation. I really want to know what you guys think. Before we go on to the info of the day, please remember to like and subscribe. Just take a moment and do that. Like I said, comments below, questions, anything. I want to hear from you. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel, that would mean a lot. It takes a lot to make this channel a lot of time, a lot of effort, but also I have a lot of expenses. I have to spend a lot of money with Motion VFX. I have to get new cameras, batteries, and all that stuff. And you can support the channel directly by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. I'll put the link on the screen and in the description. Very, very easy. And, uh, and as always, please share on social media, whether it's LinkedIn or uh, uh, Reddit or Facebook. I always forget Facebook, Twitter, any of those things. Just pop a link to the show. Talk about it. Get a discussion going. Some of you have been putting this on like the expat uh, groups in Nicaragua. That's fantastic. Thank you. Every so often I get sent screenshots of people discussing the channel and I'm like, that's so cool. Thank you. Um, so that's very much appreciated. That is how a lot of people discover the show. And uh, we did post the one of me dancing in, uh, in Nicaragua uh, to Reddit, and that's gotten a lot of positive traffic of people who think it's very funny. Uh, anyway, okay, so for the day, today is Sunday. For those of you who are only interested in the topic, you may go now, but I would prefer if you let the video run. We, the minutes do help. Um, for today, it was Sunday, so we did a lot of relaxing after uh, going out on Friday night. Yesterday, we did get a bit of sleep, so not, not terrible today. My big things today, trying to get videos done, of course, course. It's always the stuff I do on Sunday, but I spent a lot of time with my daughters today. Specifically, Lisa and I are doing a lot of school work. Um, she's, we homeschool our kids, and so some, they do a lot on their own. Very self-starters, very into their own self-pacing stuff, and it's fantastic. But sometimes they need uh, some help, and Lisa has really been pushing for a while that she feels that she goes through a semester of her history class and then spends a few, an hour or two talking to me, and she says she learns more from an hour or two with me than she does the entire semester in school. And when she's done with 
her semester, she's unhappy with history. She finds it boring and stressful and frustrating and has no idea why she's learned any of it. And when I talk to her about it, I put it in context and she gets excited and finds it interesting and fun. And, and of course, one of the advantages of homeschool or just knowing your students is I'm able to put all of history into her personal context. So when we're studying the American Revolution, I can tell her which of her family was involved and where they came from, what colonies they were in, where she was, her family was at the time that those events took place how it relates to places that she's lived. She was born in New York. Uh, she lived much of her life in Texas. She's been to many of the colonizing countries. She has this really great context for this, but if you don't know those things, to add them into the story, the story's very boring and far flung. What do, what do I have to do with the, the British colonies? Nothing, I have no idea where they are, what they are, you know, I'm so, it's just a story of some place you don't know. But when you start putting your family context into it and that kind of stuff, it really, it really makes it meaningful. And uh, one of the questions she had, I have to point this out, one of the questions she had on her um, uh, trial test, she had to do an end of semester test, and one of the questions was, uh, what is the country of, uh, it was a multiple choice, which one of these was in the Mayan Empire? And it listed some. And the answer that she had an option of was, uh, so, so there was three, one was like Brazil, which is obviously not, one was Panama, where she has lived, so that was meaningful, that it's like, oh, I've, I've lived there, that was not Mayan. The other was Honduras. And the cool thing about Honduras, one, she knew the answer, so that was great. But the other thing is that I'm like, you know, Honduras is less than two hours from here. It's about 90 minutes if you're just driving to the border and about two hours if you want to get to a crossing to the La Frontera. And she's like, wait, really? Like she knew it was kind of there. I'm like, yeah. And I, so I explained how the border between Nicaragua and Honduras was the traditional border of the Mayan Empire, that Nicaragua's border sits roughly where uh, the Mayan Empire had come to an end and the Nicaragua, uh, not exactly empire, but culture began. And it was the pressure, the military pressure of the Nicaragua culture that kept the Mayan Empire at bay to the north and to the south, kept the Incas at bay and held them apart from each other. Uh, but it ended up functioning as the trusted middle ground where both of those uh, empires were able to meet with each other safely because it was neutral territory. And she was like, that was so fascinating. And I was explaining how, you know, the Mayan cult world isn't gone. We just don't call them Mayans very often anymore. Now we call them Guatemalans and Hondurans and Salvadorans and, and you know, uh, Southern Mexicans. And she's like, wait, that's okay. I guess they kind of mentioned sort of that that they didn't exactly disappear but i didn't she's like i didn't realize that it's there i'm like yeah guatemala city is still the capital of the mayan world and they say it on things and they have mayan statues on things and the religion is still recognized if not if not practiced she's like wow that's so fascinating and now she has a connection to the mayan world now she has an interest to going and visiting mayan ruins and learning more about mayan culture because it's right there it's like she's able to reach out and touch it and connect with it and associate it with her experience and so that kind of stuff is really important with doing homeschool so we had we had a really good time going over that and what we're going to do now going forward is i'm going to look at her curriculum and see what we can do to have me teach the classes because what we've been seeing is that they're teaching like nothing it's it's like glossing over stuff, which don't get me wrong, it's like eighth grade history, so it's meant to be pretty glossy, and you're supposed to go back and fill in the gaps later, but you know, she's at an age where there's so much to learn and so much to connect with and so much human story, but they're doing such a bad job of even making history make sense, as in, why do I care? Why are you teaching it to me? And what does it have to do with anything? That's one of the, the fundamental risks of history education. Um, one is that you just get it wrong, which is often the case, but that it's often presented in such a way that students have no idea why they're learning it. If you don't know why you're learning something, you tend not to learn it. Your brain actually says, this is useless data, and as soon as you're done needing it, it wants to flush it because it has nothing to do with you. Your brain needs to be full of things that are useful to you. That's just a, a part of good brain function. So teachers who leave out that context, who fail to connect that, you know, math, why am I learning math? One of the reasons we want to get students to understand why they need to learn math is because by understanding why they need it will dramatically increase their chances of wanting to learn it, being able to learn it easily, and holding on and retaining that information later. So that's all really important. Speaking of math, we also worked on math this evening. Math is definitely something that Liesl does not enjoy. And uh, we're trying to come up with a way to improve that and make it something that she can do more easily. And uh, so we're spending more and more time working on that together. And we're going to start working. Uh, we started last night. We're trying to do every day working together um, because that's one area where her doing it on her own just isn't really working. History she can do, but she's not really learning anything. But that's not the goal, right? They're not trying to teach her. They're trying to get her through a curriculum, which is not what we want. So trying to balance those things and make them make sense as best as possible. So she and I stayed up quite 
quite late uh, tonight working on some of that and watching that 70s show. We are just got access to that uh, from Gray. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, we're, we're starting to binge it. And it also is a great opportunity. And, and as we watch it, we constantly pause it. And she asked me questions. And I talk so much about American culture, the 1970s, and all kinds of things associated with that. So she's learning a ton. And again, she's able to associate this show with me because the show starts when I'm just a few weeks old. It starts in March of 1976. Those who watch my channel know that my birthday was the 25th of February. So I am, it's roughly one month into my life is where this show is supposed to be when it starts, and it's relatively historically accurate as far as clothing and dances and music and events going on. Of course, it's a fictional sitcom, so there's no particular uh, relevance to the story, but the places and the events generally going on, the release of Star Wars, the, the, the discos that they go to, all of these things were happening when I was a very small child, and for Liesl, this creates a concrete attachment to those things so she can say, wow, this is my dad when he was really young, or this was grandpa when he was 30, 32, or whatever um so that makes for well he would have been 30 at the time he'd have been 30 at the time am i getting that right sorry dad he'd have been 29 at the time that the uh that the movie begins uh and um uh, so she can connect that and like understand how we would fit into this this show, right? My father, my parents would have been uh, young adults at the time with a, with a baby at the time of the show. I would have been a baby like the babies on the show. And there are those characters on the show. So she can be like, okay, those are the right ages of this actually happening to people. And, and the older kids, okay, do we know people who would be that age? We do. Okay, so those people would be like these kids and, and so forth and connect them together. Uh, and I think that makes that kind of thing much more, more meaningful. And it actually turns it into kind of with us stopping and doing commentary, it's very much a history and cultural lesson for her to understand uh, the times and America much better. Anyway, we're enjoying that quite a lot. She's also asked me to look into getting access again, and I think we actually have it on Amazon Prime, but I've got to check to Drunk History, because she loves that show, and she loves how it presents history. And as we were going through some things in her history, she doesn't remember them from class, she remembers the events from Drunk History. That's how she is able to get, she's like, oh, John Wilkes Booth, that's who killed Lincoln at the Ford Theater, right? I'm like, yes! She's like, yeah, I remember that from Drunk History. No idea what happened from her class. So uh, we've been having having uh, fun with that as well and looking forward to, to finding more ways to make history more engaging. We're about to start learning the second half of the American experience, the post-Civil War reconstruction and later, uh, which is one of the roughest periods to teach, I think, post-Civil War. Civil War is like oh, so much going on. I'm not even sure her class has touched on the Civil War. I think they're, they're like, there was a war. <laughs> and like, I think they just kind of gloss over it. So we may have to address some of that as well. But anyway, thanks for joining me. We've already done all the stuff. So just remember, like, subscribe, do that. I will see all of you tomorrow.